Hollow Knight sprung to greatness by evolving the Metroidvania formula. Almost supernaturally, this masterwork melange was born from an impossibly small team of two primary creators, a 2017 indie surprise that turned its disparate inspirations into a game that is equal part platformer, combat gauntlet, dungeon crawl, symphony, atmospheric masterpiece, and endlessly replayable joy. And that's a lot of parts. Today on Why Do We Like, we'll be digging into Hollow Knight, a paradoxically full game that has rightfully charmed the masses with its unparalleled radiance. But, as with the well in Dirtmouth, to enter a discussion about this game is to begin an adventure into something much deeper and much greater. To truly understand why we like Hollow Knight, we'll have to look at its every piece, from its sparsely told but robustly imagined story world, to its deeply satisfying gameplay, to the artful game design that touches every moment and suffuses it with almost surprising, soulful brilliance. And even then, as we do in Hollow Knight, we must go deeper still. So, grab your nail and cloak and join me as we embark on our own journey through Hollow Knights. We're not just skimming the surface of this labyrinthine world, we're diving into the heart of its genius. From the depths of the abyss to the very apex of Crystal Peak, every nook, every cranny holds a story, a challenge, and a piece of the puzzle that is Hollow Knight's allure. And today, we'll begin to unravel these mysteries together and tap into the beating void heart of this one-of-a-kind game. Domo, 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 domo! <laughs> it is often said that failure is an orphan, but success has many fathers. But Hollow Knight, like a modern family, had only two. Developer Team Cherry is practically a pseudonym for creators Ari Gibson and William Pellin, two Australian dreamers who turned a slapdash game gen concept into the beloved Odyssey that we know today. Released on February 24th, 2017, the seeds of Hollow Knight were actually planted a few years earlier, back in 2013, when Gibson and Pellin cranked out a game that they called Hungry Knight for the aforementioned Game Jam. In that game, a bug-like, beneedled knight character had to constantly pick up food every 10 seconds to stay alive, in keeping with that Game Jam's theme of 10 seconds. And if you really squint, you can see somewhat of a resemblance between this hungry gentleman and the knight we're eventually to know. Because these two characters are exactly identical. Upon completion of that game, Hungry Knight went to Newgrounds, where it was terribly reviewed and Team Cherry moved on with their lives, that's the way those things go. But enjoyably, years later, the game is still somehow active on Newgrounds, with the game's rating skyrocketing, as you can imagine, after the success of Hollow Knight, and with comments being left on it as recently as the day of this writing, December 14th. But not long after that, Team Cherry were made privy to another game jam, this time with the theme of Beneath the Surface. And despite missing the deadline for that jam, something about the concept resonated with them and they began to build out the idea of just what a game involving their insectoid knight exploring beneath the surface, exploring a deep, old kingdom, would look like. And things only snowballed from there. Following a massively successful Kickstarter in 2014, with Australian dollars lining their pockets, Team Cherry was able to begin development proper. Hi there, me again, mortal coil of the disembodied voice you've been hearing throughout this video. If you're liking what you're seeing, it would be jam dandy if you subscribed to the channel. Literally, 99% of the people who view my content are not subscribed to me. That's a lot of people. It's like I have an A-plus in not being subscribed to. But, much like Physics 2 after I changed my major, that's one class I'm trying to fail. But seriously, this video alone took me well over 50 hours and like 13,000 words to put together, so it really would mean a lot for your support. Also, on that note, check out my Patreon. I don't even know what to put on there yet, but if you join now, you can literally tell me what you want, and I'll probably do it. And if you want one of these sick, nasty new shirts, there's a link in the description for that as well. They're really comfy, I'm really happy with them. I designed this logo myself, and I'm just super proud of the whole endeavor. Anyway, that's enough of my face. Back to the bug. The decision to set the entire game in a buggy world was, in part, a practical one. According to an interview with Kotaku Split Screen in 2018, the impetus for this move was simply how easy a bug is to draw. As they said, you can basically draw two ovals in a line and... Baby, you got a bug going. I think I'd like my money back. In terms of actual game design, Hollow Knight was heavily influenced by two games you've heard of and one you almost certainly haven't. The first, given its Metroidvania influences, is probably fairly obvious. This is the original Metroid. It was a strong guiding light for Team Cherry. The second was Zelda 2: The Adventure of Link. Very much the red-headed stepchild of the Zelda franchise, but a very innovative game, especially for its time, and one that clearly has gone on to have quite a legacy. But perhaps its most direct inspiration was the little-discussed action RPG Fazanadu for the NES. In fact, so little discussed that I had never heard of it and had to look up how to spell it. I thought it was like far Xanadu, but it's F-A-X-A-N-A-D-U. Anyway, as much as it's an inspiration of Fa Xanadu, it's actually an inversion of that game. 
as that 1989 release followed a hero climbing upwards through an Idrisil-type tree towards the most evil creatures in the fantasy world, dwarves. While Hollow Knight flips that on its head, a journey downward to fight the most evil creatures in the real world, bugs. I hate them, they terrify me. Development began, logically, with the knight itself. As with a game that they already knew to be pretty platforming and precision heavy, having a smooth gameplay experience would be paramount. Which, of course, they nailed. Okay, so I write these scripts in pieces. This is probably not gonna be the only nail pun you get because my brain keeps going back to it. So, sorry, and you know, prepare your shade. Around the night, the world began to take shape. And as so often happens in games, the influence between gameplay and story was bi-directional. A two-way street with mechanics influencing the world and the world influencing the mechanics. Even, even just things like, as, as we worked out the mechanics of the game, things like, you know, um, you, you can heal yourself by, by absorbing soul from, from creatures and then stopping and focusing. Um, and that stuff started to then inform, you know, why can the character do that? You know, what, what makes sense if you can get soul from these, you know, other sources around the world or, you know, when you find a spell, why, what is the spell doing there? You know, what, what connection does it have to the other spells of the world and stuff like that? And things just kind of piece themselves together. A lot of the world was built from us saying, oh, I got to the end of this this pathway, but what's what could be beyond this path? And then finding out as you travel. So like, oh, there's this, I'm in a I'm in a tramway, but this tram, this tram path has been all ruined and they've stopped development. But what what stopped this development? And then you think, well, I would love to see what's on the other side of that. So you build that out yourself. And then by the time you get there, you're like, oh, well, look, I found an interesting character here. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's about allowing, allowing ideas to lead on to other ideas. And through this process, the snowball began to build. The map grew, scope increased. Christopher Larkin was pulled in to do the magnificent soundtrack. And as 2014 turned into 2015 and 2016, the snowball grew bigger, better. And then, finally, in the first quarter of 2017, it came rolling out to the masses, ready to bowl us over like a wintry Indiana Jones. So, the game is finally out. But, like, what is it? I'm glad you asked. Me? Like any good piece of art, Hollow Knight is so much more than the sum of its parts. It defies an easy explanation. Just look at this video's runtime. But to get an idea of how it can possibly be more than the sum of its many elements, we're gonna have to look at them elements. So now, without further ado, I present... <laughs> to experience Hollow Knight is not so much to play a story, as in many games, but to be immersed in a world suffused with lore. And the lore of Hollow Knight is opaque, that world mysterious. As a move, this is not on its own, of course, in innovation. Many Metroidvanias are games of sparse stories and spare worlds, tales more singularly focused on our hero and their survival than on the environments they traverse on the way to their goal. Take, for an example, the more recent Metroid Dread, an incredible game in its own right and one that takes that sort of storytelling approach. The world is richly imagined, but that world in a storytelling sense is inert. Though the world does respond in some way to Samus's actions, lava flow switching polarity and icy breakout in the third act, these are not so much storytelling beats as simple cause and effect. Nothing here is tied to the story of Planet ZDR, a name which is meant to evoke spacey otherness, which it does, but also speaks to the same general phenomenon I'm describing here. It's an acronym. Its name is not important. Its story is not important. What is important is Samus, simply and purely, and her escape from that planet. And to be clear, this is not to say that the game is story-less. It has a story and one that I think works incredibly well for the Metroid universe. But it's more of a protracted three-panel comic than anything else. There's a backstory, thin but workmanlike, that gets Samus to ZDR. There's a setup. Samus has somehow ended up in the depths of this dangerous world and must escape. And really no true drama until the incredible surprise of the climax. Again, to be clear, I think what Dread does really works for the game that it is, but it is more simple, more classically Metroidvania than the approach Team Cherry takes in Hollow Knight. Here, the world is story, and pervasively so. The tragedy of Hollow Knight is a deeply compelling one, a tale told far less in dialogue than in environments, contextual understanding, and fragments of extant writing from the fallen civilization all around you. On our journey through the world of Hollow Knight, we as players aren't just warriors, we're archaeologists. That belongs in a museum! Trying to understand the story of the world we're exploring based on its ruins. It's a brave move from a storytelling perspective. For any creator, it's a common natural impulse to want your audience to, you know, fully experience and fully understand the world you've built, the breadth and depth that you've put in for them to explore, not just because you love it, but you put a lot of work into it, damn it. So, really leaning into your world story in this manner, via breadcrumb as opposed to full bites, is an impressively large example of the writing advice of killing one's darlings. Or at least, I don't know, maiming them? You're not totally getting rid of them, you're just making them a lot harder to access. So, 
Humble as devs Ari and William seem to be, this is the move of a supremely confident artist. And it's an ethos that's central to Hollow Knight, as it's not just the narrative that is easily missable to a casual player, but a legion of secrets, and even a handful of incredible kingdoms like the Queen's Gardens, the White Palace, the Hive, that could fully pass a player by. It's also worth noting that this is a high-risk approach. It does not always pay off. At worst, you risk telling an unclear story, one of the cardinal sins of narrative. It doesn't matter how great a world you've built if the way you lay it out is confusing or obtuse. But if you do do it well, you could become one of the most beloved indie games of all time. And heck, why not launch a few YouTube careers out of it? What that means is that Hollow Knight very much comes from the Dark Souls school of storytelling, not the only Soulsborne inspiration the game takes, and finds a way to make it its own. This game respects the intelligence of its players, never spoon-feeding them the narrative. Instead, it scatters breadcrumbs of lore across its expansive and beautifully hand-drawn world. This approach creates a sense of discovery and wonder that we rarely get to experience in games these days. It's like reading a novel where half the pages are missing, but each page is so well written that you're compelled to fill in the blanks with your own information and in a way that is cohesive and makes sense. This game elevates itself by trusting the player to connect those dots, to engage in a kind of conversational storytelling. It's a bold, confident move in an era where many games lead players by the hand, perhaps too much so. Hollow Knight doesn't just tell you a story, it invites you into a dance of discovery where each step unveils a fragment of its hidden narrative. This masterful blend, this show-don't-tell and environmental storytelling creates an experience that's as haunting as it is enchanting. In Hollow Knight, the story is a living, breathing part of the world, and uncovering it is as rewarding as any boss fight or any platforming challenge. And you don't have to die along the way. Domo, 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 Domo! <laughs> no one will ever top the incredible moss bag when it comes to breaking down the lore of the game, but in general, the story of Hollow Knight goes something like this. Hollow Nest was a once great kingdom, but it has fallen into ruin. This ruin was brought about by a mysterious and madness-inducing infection that spread throughout the kingdom. The source of this infection is something called the Radiance, an ancient moth god that only persists in the world of dreams, but whose effect on the physical world remains quite strong. To combat this infection, Hollow Nest's ruler, the Pale Cam, came up with the macabre strategy of using his own essence to create vessels, hollow beings that contain neither will nor mind, and thus would be immune to the mind-bending effects of the Radiance's plague. This was not an easy process, as the Abyss shows. Countless beings, countless vessels were created as Hollow Knights, only to be cast away before one was finally deemed pure enough, or empty enough, to be the kingdom's scapegoat, sealing the source of the Radiance's infective power within its body before that body was sealed again, with the help of beings that became known as the Dreamers in the Black Egg Temple, and in so doing, interring the affection for good. Or, so it was thought. For the Hollow Knight was in the end not a pure vessel, but contained a shred of its own will, allowing the Radiance's infection, for which it was at ground zero, to seep back through, to take influence, and to return once again to Hollow Knight. Our journey as the Knight, simply THE Knight, not the Hollow Knight, as naming conventions would imply, a common mistake, takes us on a quest to find these dreamers, sever their link to the Black Egg Temple in order to allow us entry, and to defeat the corrupted Hollow Knight, and sacrifice ourselves in similar fashion, containing the Radiance and its blight for a time but only truly beginning the cycle anew. At least, that is one ending, but in this game, there are many. If one truly explores the entirety of Hollowness, they will find the King's Vessel and transform it into the Void Heart, allowing the final battle against the Hollow Knight to take a different shape. This time, after bringing the Hollow Knight to its knees, we're granted the opportunity to dream nail our way into its mind, to the very source of the infection, and fight the Radiance itself. And if we manage to vanquish it, the infection is defeated once and for all. Of course, there's also a bunch of other crazy shit that can happen, especially in the DLC, where there's an entirely new ending depending on you beating an insane 50-man boss rush without dying and becoming a vessel for a new entity known as the Gate of Gods, but that's a separate conversation. Actually discovering the true arc of this narrative is pretty difficult, it's pretty hidden when you play the game, but once you see how it all comes together, I think you get a really new level of appreciation for it. This is a really interesting story, a unique story, and above all, a tragic one. It's part of the really interesting flavor of Hollow Knight that it leans so hard into this melancholy, into the horrid happenings of the world of Hollow Knight that happened before we got here, and I think it's something that really helps the game stand out. This isn't a heroic journey, not really. This is a sad one, and the redemption of an even worse one. Domo, 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 Domo! <laughs> Hollow Knight itself consists of 16 explorable regions, as well as the hub town of Dirtmouth. Each region features their own distinct design and coloration, a testament to the art direction that we'll explore later, and are interconnected in ways both obvious and ingenious. As we traverse Hollow Knight, we come to learn ever more about its world through this environmental storytelling and these beautifully palleted landscapes. The wonderful flavor and variety that these sub-areas bring to the Hollow Knight experience are a massive part of why we like Hollow Knight as much as we do, so I'm going to take a brief moment to give each their due. 
there's the sparse, melancholic, forgotten crossroads. Here, the game begins in earnest. It's a sprawling set of dusty, gray paths filled with desiccated shells and the game's first enemies, and it introduces us to touch points like bosses, stag stations, shortcuts, dark rooms, combat zones, and environmental hazards that will last throughout the game. Later, after finding our first dreamer or unlocking the monarch wings, the Forgotten Crossroads truly succumbs to the infection's influence, becoming a perverted but plagued version of the simple entry point we once knew, now the Infected Crossroads. This is one of my favorite tricks in the Metroidvania Toolkit, when your actions in the world cause that world to change for the harsher, corrupting areas you knew, thought safe, had conquered. It's like the scouring of the Shire, just with more bugs. Typically up next is the Verdant Green Path. I'm gonna go through these vaguely in the order you encounter them as a player, but as the game is so modular, so sequence breakable, there is no one critical path. Green Path is our first departure from the drab melancholy of Dirtmouth and the Crossroads, as lush as its name would imply, with even the enemies being covered in flora. Here, the environmental dangers turn from spikes to the more contextually fitting thorns, the sort of thoughtful changes that permeate the game and give it such vibrance. It's also our first glimpse of Hornet, the closest thing we'll have to a friend throughout our journey, though she's really more of a rival, the Gary Oak to our Ash Ketchum, as it were. Contrary to what its appellation implies, Fog Cannon feels more like a series of claustrophobic corridors, and in those corridors you find infected jellyfish big and small, with the big ones packing one of the more annoying bunches in the game, homing in on you after taking a nail strike and exploding in an AoE that will knock you for two masks, a painful toll at any point in the game, but a near death sentence when you first happen upon the canyon. We soon find the mustily mycological fungal waste, where acid burbles and long stalked mushrooms serve as delightful little bounce pads, little trampolines that we can strike with our nail to gain extra height and traverse the level as it was meant to be traversed. We don't have our double jump here yet, we don't have the monarch wings, but these trampoline mushrooms do that job for us, and it gives some extra flavor and depth to a world and colors the experience a little more greatly than if we had just been there with the skills that we had at the time. These wastes are also home to the Mantis tribe, a group of proud warriors who for some reason are able to avoid the effects of the infection. In the depths of their village, their lords await us with incredible music and an incredible battle that is one of the game's first big difficulty spikes. Here you take on the trio of baddies, not at once, but one at a time, and then two at a time, in a spiked environment that is one of the trickiest places we've been in so far. It's a really fun battle, and if you conquer it, you're given access to Deep Nest, but that's for later. At the center of all this is the iconic, pathetic, fallacy, pluviosity of the City of Tears, by which I just mean it rains there a lot. Here, water forever tumbles down in almost magical fashion into the underground city. Long ago, before the era of this falling water, the city was the thriving capital of Hallonest, home to their society's upper crust. In typical NIMBY fashion, the city shut its gates after learning of the spreading infection, sealing itself off to the world. This proved to be a fruitless measure, and once the infection did enter, the city still fell to ruin. The rain came later, as empty years passed and the rock above began to splinter, allowing water from the massive blue lake to seep in, drip by drip, damming the city to ceaseless rainfall and starting a clock that would tick down to its thalassic doom. The city is perhaps the most traversed portion of Hollowness, serving not just as a crossroads, but as a home to the Soul Sanctum, Lurian the Dreamer, the money hub of Relic Seeker Lem, and the all-important Nailsmith, whose weapon upgrades are one of the most pivotal parts of getting around the rest of the dangerous Hollowness. At the apex of Hollowness are the mechanized mines of Crystal Peak, an endless series of shafts where the bugs of Hollowness mined the crystal ore that they used for energy, and which is still populated by enemy bugs to this day. Many of these bugs are covered in impenetrable crystals, something we can't get through with our nail forcing the player to very purposefully consider their combat and platforming decisions throughout. The Crystal Peak is home to the optional but badass Descending Dark, the upgraded version of the downspelled Desolate Dive. With its invincibility frames, D-Dark is a must-have for late-game battles, despite being yet another of the game's many missable upgrades. Again, props to Team Cherry. The Peak is also home to the absolutely mandatory Crystal Dash, the sick Super Dash that unlocks vast new swaths of the game world, as well as just generally being a much better, much cooler way to get around. For those with a speedrunning inclination, it's also a pivotal tool in getting in and out of areas that would typically require even later game items like Isma's 2. Now, as promised, we have the claustrophobic horrors of Deep Nest. The less said about Deep Nest, the better, because fuck this place. So dark it requires a lantern item to traverse, and crammed full of the most terrifying enemies yet, Deep Nest is the most painful part of any Hollow Knight playthrough. But, at the very least, it is that on purpose. In fact, the sprawling deepness that we know in the game was actually much, much larger once upon a time, but blessedly fell away in late development cuts. Conquering deep nest is unfortunately necessary as Hera the Dreamer is located at its deepest point. There's also a hilarious cutscene as the knight sits in a bench that is an obvious trap, so at least there's that. The Weathered Wasteland of the Howling Cliffs 
Despite serving as the opening area of the game, the Hound Cliffs is actually a much more desolate, sprawling area that the player can only access after acquiring either the Mantis Claw or Crystal Dash. One of the game's many warrior dreams rests here, as is the Inner Sanctum that activates the Grim Troop DLC and a handful of other secrets, walls behind walls and that sort of thing. The area is also home to the sub-area of Stag Nest, which is only truly accessible after unlocking every one of the game's other stag stations. A catch-all wasteland at the fringe of our known world, Kingdom's Edge is home to the game's delightful Colosseum, the Colosseum of Fools, as well as a few secrets and things like Nail Master Oro. Most plot-relevantly, it's home to the cast-off shell of the Pale King, where, after defeating Hornet for the second time, we're able to acquire the King's brand, allowing us to access Hollow Nest's deepest point, the Abyss. It's also one of the few areas that let us peek beyond our game's world, with the unknown hinterlands visible on the outside of a hidden tent that the persistent player can find. Like the best of Hollow Knight, it implies much by telling us little, showing us that even beyond the withering end of this withering kingdom, there's still a world to explore. Home of the Seer, the Dream Nail, and the player's first encounter with the Warrior Dream, the Western Ground is one of the less traversed areas of the game, though with its stag station, it's often a great jumping off point to access other areas of the game. Also, it's home to the worst side quest in the game. Uh -oh. The Poopy Royal Waterways Beneath the City of Tears are the Royal Waterways, the fetid fecal home of some of the game's worst sounds, but one of its most delightful bosses in the Dung Defender. Doma, 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 doma. <laughs> I really hate it down here, but it's the easiest way to unlock the Ancient Basin, and the only way to get to the Junk Pit, which contains the God Seeker and thus the entrance to the Godmaster DLC. Despite my aversion to the vibes, one thing I do love about the concept of the waterways is that it embodies that world-building feeling of if this, then what, the Team Cherry had discussed in their development of Hollow Knight. A teeming city like the City of Tears would have required real water and sewage infrastructure to maintain, and I love that they just went, fuck it, realistic sewer with the poop boss. Beneath the waterways are the bygone desolation of Ancient Basin. Populated by fossil, rock, shadow, and trilobite, the Ancient Basin was where the Kingdom of Hollowness began, and the former home to the illustrious White Palace. Now it's but a path to the Abyss, the Broken Vessel boss fight that unlocks the Monarch Wing's double jump, and a stag station that was added late in development where Team Cherry figured it was a pain to get down there. But most importantly, it serves as the entrance to the White Palace, the beautiful, dangerous, optional area only accessible by obtaining the Awoken Dream Nail and using it on the Fallen King's Mold in front of the debris of the once great palace. Though optional to attain the game's first ending, Conquering the White Palace is necessary to unlock the game's true ending and to truly save the kingdom from the infection. Inside the King's Mole Dream, the knight is subjected to a brutal gauntlet of platforming, the most exacting test yet of jump, dash, and pogo, requiring near mastery in order to complete. And at the end, you attain half of the King's Soul that the true ending requires. Upon completion, the area is shuttered for good, impossible to be re-entered. But before leaving, a hidden path awaits only the most intrepid of travelers. Added in the Grim Troop DLC, the Path of Pain is a downright masochistic test of skill, enterable through the most hidden path in the game and meant to grind even the most masterful platformer down to a white palette pulp. But also, this area fucking rules. Like so many things in this game, it's a challenge that deeply rewards the efforts taken to complete it. I was ecstatic when I finally beat it for the first time, making my way through the seemingly endless subpaths without losing all my mask, doing feats that I would have otherwise thought impossible. The path ends with an even more hilariously masochistic touch too. After all of that, after all this insane traversal, with your health and soul resources likely bottomed out, the final room contains two King's Mold, each of which can chunk you for two masks of health, potentially forcing a reset of the entire path with one fell swoop. Even crazier than that too is the modders who have built paths of their own, try so sinister they make the original Path of Pain look like stepping over a crack in pavement, but I digress. Overall, so good, so thrilling, so nail-biting. 10 out of 10 would claw my eyes out again. At the bottom of the world, its horrors locked behind Magical Seal, beneath even the bedrock of hollowness lies the Abyss. It is the home of the dark essence of the world, the Void, and the final resting place for the corpses of teeming millions of failed vessels, all almost identical to our night. So pervasive that you quite literally can't take a step without their forgotten remnants landing underfoot. Populating this defiled place are the ominously named Siblings, the implication obvious that they, but for the grace of God, could be us, the failed experiments of what we are meant to complete. The environmental hazards here are void itself, with black tendrils that slither wildly and hiss, seemingly threatening to take us down to eternal blackness should we fall to them. In this place, we find the Shade Cloak, a killer upgrade that imbues the Knight's Dash with phase powers, letting him go through anything in his path, even the tendrils of void that have blocked our path on more than a few occasions in the past. There's a recharge time for this, but it's pretty reasonable. I want to linger for a moment on just how this upgrade is unlocked with the knight having to jump into this 
overflowing pool of inky blackness being held in the hands of some ancient, unknowable entity. There are more than a few upgrades attained in this fashion, something with its outstretched hands, and along with being a great homage to the classic Metroid-style Chozo statues, these are just so deeply evocative. They prompt questions about the world that will never get answers to, and it makes the entire experience feel all the grander for it. The Abyss is also home to the upgraded Howling Wraith spell, the Abyss Shriek. This is another incredible unlock, requiring a sharp eye and necessitating reading the context of the room you're in. The clear conventions of the game implying that there's something to be had here, and putting two and two together that these shrieking statues in the backdrop exactly resemble those that come out when we cast Howling Wraiths. Moi, Chef's Kiss, or maybe in this case, Chef's Shriek. <laughs> Taking the lush, serene aesthetic of Greenpath and warping it into something far more wicked, the Queen's Gardens is the verdantly vicious home of the Mantis Lord and his traitors, members of a race who, despite their ability to resist the infection, chose to embrace the infection's power and thus exile themselves from their home. This warped mentality pervades the area, one of the game's best, creating a dangerous jungle-like feel, where powerful enemies are always a lurk, and what is beautiful is almost always just as deadly. Here, in the final optional area of the game, at least final in the order we're looking at, waits the White Lady, counterpart to the Pale King, the mother of all vessels who is bound eternally to her rooted home. She's an incredible visual, really one of the more stunning moments in the game, one of the more stunning characters, and when you come across her and find out what her lore relevance is, it's just awesome. She ends up gifting the knight half of the king's soul that is necessary to achieve the game's true ending. Oh, and I completely forgot to mention when recording, there's also the Hive, a fun, cool, optional area that has a secret boss, the Hive Knight, as well as one charm, but really not much else going to it beyond that. So really, in a word, bees. Put it all together, and what you have is an incredibly well-realized world, especially for an indie property. Some of the best pieces of art, some of the best pieces of media, have things in them that feel like they would exist in this world and none other. That phrase, in this world and none other, is something that I heard once from a screenwriting professor of mine, and I found it to be extremely valuable both in my own works and when evaluating other creative works. Doing something like that, making sure that your properties, your entities, your proper nouns exist only in the space of the world that you're creating, forces you to imbue specificity and purpose into everything you do. And here, as within all of Hollow Knight, that specificity, that effort, is supremely well rendered. The beautiful art direction is just the cherry on top. It's the veneer over which all of the great creative ideas is put in front of us, and it's a big part of why we like Hollow Knight as much as we do. Connecting all these realms are the Stag Stations, one of the game's two fast travel systems, with the tram being the other one, the less useful item-gated second option. The Stag Station is the primary mode of fast travel, open as soon as the player finds their first station in the wild, and upon finding the last, they're granted access to the Stag Nest, where a vessel fragment awaits, as well as a broken egg, implying that the last stag, who has been giving us rides around for this whole game and who believes himself to be the final member of his race, maybe isn't so final after all. Team Cherry was deliberate in their placement of all these stations, not just to maximize the feeling of player exploration and the idea that there could always be another secret around the corner, but also, in their words, because they playtest these games for months and months and months, and they would go crazy if the stations were any further apart. Now, having said that, I've always thought there should probably be like one or two more stag stations. They did always feel too far apart. And I understand that this is a game that emphasizes travel and exploration, but a little bit more convenience would not have hurt, especially as the game went on, and I was getting more into my completionist mode, trying to find things that are spread throughout the map without any real correlation to how close they are to a stag station or not. There are also scores of hidden paths connecting these realms, all joys to find, from the secret entrance to the Blue Lake from the Forgotten Crossroads, to the secret connection between the Junk Pit and the Nailsmith's Room in the City of Tears, and far, far beyond. Doma, 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 doma! <laughs> Rounding out the world of Hollow Knight are its many delightful NPCs. This surprisingly robust cast of characters contains far more death than one would expect, or at least than I expected, especially given that all their appearances are still relatively few and far between, less populated with dialogue and conversations, and more just thoughtfully placed within the game's oblique storytelling apparatus, allowing them to shine in their own sparse ways, with the best of them having the implication that there's more beneath the surface than you'd ever expect. A microcosm of Hollow Nest itself. Some standouts. The Nailsmith. Hollow Knight's classic spin on the ascetic craftsman, the Nailsmith lives in a simple hut outside the City of Tears, a Spartan existence built around his singular driving desire to craft the perfect weapon. I love the little cutscene you get when he crafts you a weapon, just the perfect representation of less is more. A swipe in the darkness, the crash of metal on an anvil, and one final swipe revealing the nail master behind it all. If and when you do forge your pure nail, which is pretty much massively necessary if you want to complete any challenge beyond the game's basic ending, you're given the heartbreaking chance to strike the nailsmith down. A shocking but fitting request as, having fulfilled his life's purpose in forging the pure nail, 
there's nothing left for him, and no more fitting an end than the samurai's death of being struck down with his own perfect weapon. I always chose this option, as it always just felt right despite being tragic, it was honoring his wishes after all. But I was delighted to find out that you don't have to do that if you don't strike him down, you can end up finding him living out the rest of his days with Shio in their hut in Greenpath modeling for a fellow craftsman and spending their twilight years together in secluded harmony while the world around them crumbles due to the infection. You know, when you put it like that, it's basically the long, long time episode of The Last of Us, except I'm not sobbing at the end. Except the more I think about it, the more it really is beautiful and heartbreaking. And oh god, cut the tape! Hello, nightly traveler and self-obsessed blowhard, Zote is one of the game's great additions, his haggard eyes and misshapen horns painting the perfect picture of one whose ambitions outstrip his abilities. It's always fun when you find him in varying states of danger throughout the game, from being actively under attack by Avengefly King, just north of Greenpath, to being in webbed in Deep Nest, to being locked up in the Colosseum of Fools and also serving as one of the misdirect final bosses of one of those gauntlets. His many tenets are all hilarious bits of writing and characterization, and the DLC put the perfect cherry on top of it all, letting us drop into the dream world to take on Zote as Zote sees himself, a beefcake hunk, a rapier-wielding warrior worthy of worship. And not only is this fight shockingly hard, a delightful little challenge, but it's also incredibly fitting of Zote, his chaotic, narcissistic nature coming out of every facet, from the Zotelings to his mistimed jumps to his sorely prancing. It's an incredible fight and the perfect way to cap off the Zote experience. Tiso plays a small role, but I think is done perfectly well. It's simple storytelling, but a great design. He's terse, he's arrogant, he's dead. I don't like Tiso the bug person, but I really like Tiso the storytelling device. The Nail Masters. I talk about them a little more elsewhere, so I won't go too hard right now, but I just really love these guys. They're extremely distinctive in the game, characters that really stand out, and they're given great bits of characterization, not just through their regular dialogue, but through the Dream Nail dialogue that hints at each of their brothers' locations and fates. But for me, it's the Godmaster fights that really elevate them, adding dimensionality by seeing the way that they truly earn and embody their Nail Master titles. Plus, it's fun seeing such rotund, chunky boys fight so gracefully. And jumping off that, I also really like that the true Nail Sage, the master of the Nail Masters, is not a fellow behemoth, but the tiny, unremarkable slot. Super pleasing contrast, both visually and conceptually. Milibel is another great character whose depths I only really found about recently, and when I did, it had me cackling with laughter. Behind her grandmotherly facade lurks a criminal mastermind. As the banking service she pretends to offer ends up being outright theft, she will abscond with your geo after your initial deposit, never to be seen again. But for me, despite having played through this game a handful of times, I never knew this simply because I never went back. Every time I would put some Geo in there as I first passed by, thinking it was a prudent financial move in case I got got somewhere along my journey and lost all my precious loot. But I would always come across this early game, she's in Fog Canyon before you've even made your way to the City of Tears the first time, so my deposit would be paltry. And as the playthrough progressed, it never really felt like the stop there, as there was always so much else to do elsewhere and so much easy Geo to read. But Every time I also found myself thinking, what a terrible banking system it was. Part of why I'd never gotten back. I was so annoyed. It's yet another instance of the shit infrastructure in Bugsville. There's just a single banker off the beaten path with no ability to withdraw your funds elsewhere. What kind of ramshackle enterprise is this? We had a better system than this in like the Middle Ages. Which, of course, turns out I was totally right. That's totally the point. The enterprise is not just ramshackle, but criminal in nature. And that little buggy bitch had no compunction about taking my hard-earned moolah and disappearing. The whole experience was just so funny to me, I loved learning about it, and it's yet another example of the depth of the Hollow Nest experience. There are little moments like this that you may not experience in many playthroughs, but that are constantly there and constantly adding to the flavor of the world. The Snail Shamans, I love the Snail Shamans, less for their particular design, it's, it's fine enough, but more because of how the Shamans get iterated on in the ways specific to the spells they give you. The Crystallized Shaman that bestows Descending Dark, the mechanical monstrosity version in Soul Sanctum, the overgrown mound one that bestows the howling race, even the shaman sarcophagus. All just great specific touches, variations on a theme that feel as though they belong in this world and no other. And that's great writing, great creating. And of course, capping it all off is Miss Get Good herself, star of a theoretical sequel that shall not be named, and the Supergirl to our knight Superman, Hornet. Just a few simple visual tweaks from the knight's design create another extremely distinctive vessel character, clearly akin to us, but entirely her own being with very fun changes to her weapon, a needle and thread as opposed to our nail. She doesn't even seem to have arms, and frankly, doesn't even seem to need them. We stand a differently able queen. The similarly tragic daughter of the Pale King and dreamer Hera the Beast, Hornet is one of the few repeating presences on our journey, and certainly the most meaningful, evolving from disdainful to taunting to supportive as we prove our mettle against her again and again. 
Her journey alongside us takes us to the very end of our adventure, providing us an opportunity in our final fight with the Hollow Knight to use our Dream Nail to enter its consciousness and fight and destroy the Radiance once and for all. Now if only six on would come out and we could finally- Doma, 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 Doma! <laughs> to risk a tautology, Hollow Knight is its gameplay. Games are most often a duelist medium, with the two main elements of gameplay and story being distinct, used to inform each other, but experienced largely at separate times. The story through cutscenes, and the gameplay through, well, gameplay. But in Hollow Knight, the gameplay is the only way to piece together the story. You must defeat challenging optional bosses and conquer rigorous platforming challenges to be fed even the faintest snippets of lore. These two gameplay loops, the platforming and the combat, make up almost the entirety of the Hollow Knight experience, and they're rendered about as well as you will ever see in gaming. And as you get deeper into the game, it becomes even harder to disentangle the two. The late game bosses are practically platforming puzzles in their own way. The late game platforming requires combat skills to complete. It's an incredible synthesis of ideas and bolstered by the fact that the playing experience is seamless, fun, and deeply gratifying. So let's try to unmix this soup a little bit and see what makes each of these individual elements so great. Platforming. The ever-present platforming in Hollow Knight is easy to pick up, but almost impossible to truly master. Jumps are, rather obviously, the backbone of the platformer. The knight's jumps are buttery smooth and were an early point of emphasis for Team Cherry in the dev process. We wanted players to feel totally in control of their character at all times, so our model for movement was the Mega Man and Mega Man X series, says Pellin. The knight has no acceleration or deceleration on horizontal movement. The jump has a lot of initial lift, releasing the button cuts vertical speed quickly, and the dash completely arrests vertical movement, shooting you forward instantly. This all adds up to an unusually high degree of control in midair. This intention, Pellin explains, is to make the players feel that any hit they take or mistake they make could have been avoided right up to the last second. It's a principle that we tried to roll out through the rest of the game, but it all started with the knight's run and jump, the very first things to be coded. And they really, wait for it, nail it. It's always a pleasure to jump around and navigate the world as the knight, and the instant input response is the great result of meaning that you are always in control of your character. Fun platforming moments and navigational wins, you did that. Devastating failure and crashing into an abyss? You did that too. The experience of growth that the player has while gaining ever more platforming abilities is also tangibly delightful. And as your arsenal grows to include the Mothwing Cloak, Mantis Claw, Crystal Dash, Monarch Wings, and Shade Cloak, and your ability to find ever more ways to hop, skip, and jump across the Hellenist and Vires increases, it's hard to not feel like a flow state badass. With the immediacy of response to player input that is so central to this game, combined with the many different mechanics the game introduces as you progress, bolstered by the fact that most of these effects are order independent, meaning that you can follow up almost any move with any other, an endless array of possibilities. Pushed even further by the fact that pogoing off an enemy refreshes most of these abilities, means that the movement possibilities are almost literally endless, allowing each player to play in their own way, choosing their own adventure, and creating and executing on whatever style feels natural to them. Wow, that was one sentence. Flowcharting out every possible option for a player's movement would make you feel like you were on the hunt for Pepe Silvia. Can we talk about the mail, please, Mac? I'm dying to talk about the mail with you all day, okay? In the base game, the platform challenges peak with the critical path of the White Palace, where a very spike-heavy aesthetic forces the knight to pull out all of his stops if he hopes to access the upper atrium of the palace, where the final half of the King's Soul charm awaits, pivotal to accessing the game's true ending and a prize for a master of Hollow Knight's movement. And that about does it for the platforming section that- uh oh the sick bastards of Team Cherry just couldn't leave well enough alone, could they? A late coming addition to the game, part of the Grim Troop DLC, Hollow Knight introduces an even more dastardly assemblage of platforming bullshit in the Path of Pain, one of the most difficult traversal sections in, I'm pretty sure, modern gaming. Located after destroying and moving through an essentially invisible path in the White Palace's walls, this final brutal gauntlet forces the knight and the player to truly pull out all the stops and use every tool in our tiny tool belt to reach its end. There are no true checkpoints along the path, just pit stops where the knight can recharge soul to refuel health for the next set of forthcoming deaths. The path sets its exacting tone from the beginning, forcing you to make a double jump to a small section of wall that overhangs an infinite void, something that anywhere else, in any other game, would lead to nowhere. I remember my first time getting to this jump and pretty much audibly gulping as I realized what I was in for. And that, of course, is just the beginning, the overture to this symphony of frustration that is sure to follow or even the slightest missed input will send you back, sometimes way back, to your last pit stop, forcing you to jump, dash, pogo, and precisely position yourself with actual perfect accuracy once again if you hope to make it to the next section. And as one final cruel hilarious joke, the very last room pits you not against a platforming challenge but against two king's molds, powerful and largely unfamiliar enemies who can each chunk you for two masks a pop when your mass count is probably dangerously low, meaning 
you could be sent back all the way to the very beginning if you die. The one, the one kindness offered along the path is that the soul totems at each checkpoint are infinite, meaning that you can always bring your health back to full after a death and a respawn. This was, to me, a perfect touch, as this is an endurance challenge, and with an infinite pool of health available to all challengers, the only thing standing between the knight and the goal is the player's own tenacity. Or maybe masochism. Honestly, what's the difference? Domo, 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 Domo! <laughs> Combat is the other central pillar of the Hollow Knight experience, and the main element of the game that comes to mind when I conjure up its title in my head. As mentioned, Team Cherry was laser focused on dialing in the feel of the knight character, and this is obvious when playing through the game's evolving combat challenges, as no matter how much complexity is added, the knight remains a joy to play. In fact, the growth of your arsenal is one of the most delightful elements of the game, as is common in Metroidvanias. To use an on-the-nose metaphor, it's like watching our weak caterpillar self evolve into a combat butterfly, one capable of some real Ninjago special ops shit. And it's hard to put into words the joy that a player can feel after seeing the same character that they started the game with, basically only capable of jumping and slashing, doing some spell sword neo double jump tap dance spirit bomb fuckery as you take on the biggest and baddest bugs that Hollowness has to offer. On the whole, the combat here is simple in its conception, but it's in the execution where things really get complicated. As a 2D game, there are only ever four directions the knight can go, four directions he can swing his nail in. But as our character evolves, he gains myriad more options, from further soul-based spells, descending dark and abyss shriek, to the ever more vital nail arts, to the augmented options provided by the game's impressive bevy of charms, all of which bring great complexity and optionality to every split second of the combat experience. These moves are worth narrowing in on as well. Over the course of the game, the knight acquires three incredibly useful spells all of which are capable of being upgraded in really fun ways. None of these upgrades are mandatory, nor are they even along the critical path. But if a player hopes to conquer Hollow Knight's ever greater late game challenges, they are pretty damn necessary. Also, they're all badass. The first, Vengeful Spirit, is a simple left-right spell that is the only move capable of taking out enemies from a distance. This spell is on the critical path, as our only way of getting out of the Forgotten Crossroads and into Green Path proper is blocked by an Elder Baldur who we can only damage with the Vengeful Spirit. Its upgrade, the Shade Soul, a blackened version of the same sprite, is found behind a locked door in the City of Tears, and not only goes slightly faster, but also penetrates all objects in its path, a pretty vital upgrade that really ups its effectiveness and overall damage potential. The Desolate Dive, cast with Down B, is the only other spell on the critical path, acquired after defeating the Soul Master, for whom it is the signature move. To that point, the move was actually originally called the Tyrant's Fist when it was first revealed in its Kickstarter update, the connection being that the Soul Master's dream form is called the Soul Tyrant. This move allows us to break through the many shoddy floors of hollowness, signposted to the player by a telltale rumbling and shaking of debris as we walk over them. This spell's upgrade, Descending Dark, is found in Crystal Peak, and is one of the most clutch moves in the game, as it comes with nearly a half a second of invulnerability, along with dealing heavy AoE burst damage, making it crucial for use in intense single or multi-target battles. Our last spell, Howling Wraiths, the Up B cast, is an optional find acquired in the overgrown mound near Fog Canyon. It's a multi-hit spell and another great AoE clear, with the added benefit that using it in midair fully pauses the knight's movement, further enhancing the many movement possibilities the game offers. This spell's upgrade, the Abyss Shriek, comes from a moment that, to me, is one of the game's best when we have to piece together context clues in an otherwise purposeless chamber in the Abyss. Once upgraded, this move is strong as fuck, a powerhouse move that leaves you vulnerable to other spells, but while dealing out such impressive damage that the trade-off is often worth it. Exemplary of this, speedrunners use this move to take out Grimm and Nightmare King Grimm in his fireball form in a way that, quite honestly, puckers me up every time. The Nail Arts are the other set of optional combat maneuvers, the physical yin to the spell's magical yang. These are the Cyclone Slash, taught by Nailmaster Mado, the Dash Slash, the signature art of Nailmaster Oro, and the Great Slash that is the specialty of Nailmaster Shio. In my first playthrough, I ended up ignoring these, but I really did so to my detriment as it turns out that not only are these arts incredible damage-dealing tools, but they're also deeply satisfying to use. The Cyclone Slash looks the coolest, but frankly found the least use from me, as it locks the knight into what I believe is his longest animation in the game. It's good AoE coverage, but is outclassed by spells like D-Dark and Abyss Shriek. It does have this fun added element to making the knight drop through the air like a rock, which is cool flavor, but really just ended up being something that caused me to lose massive health whenever I used it unwittingly, something that definitely cost me a Coliseum run or two. Oops! Thus, the Dash Slash and the Great Slash ended up being two of my main boss damaging moves, almost more so than the regular Nail Slashes, as later bosses move so fast and pack such damaging power that the best strategy was very often to get in for a single power-packed hit and get back out to safety. 
The dash slash allowing you to cover great slash at a great distance was a massively useful poke tool, and the great slash with its huge hitbox was also incredible for maximizing your ability to hit any boss, whether nimble, oversized, or tiny. I'm looking at you, Slot. In addition to the complexity that arises from the inputs, the game offers dozens of charms, which provide unique powers to the knight both in and out of combat, and a delightful system that really empowers the player to tailor their experience and get the most out of the elements they want to get the most out of. Please note how much restraint I used in not saying charming there. Most charms are fairly standard fare, like increased damage, increased reach, and increased soul collection. Though a few get really weird with it, like the Defender's Crest, which exudes a poopy aura so pungent that it damages enemies. But further elevating the system is the many fun synergies that exist between particular sets of charms. These are really cool, really easy to miss in a casual playthrough because they aren't listed, so I'll hit you with some of the cooler ones as I focus on here. Quick Focus plus Shape of Un doubles your movement speed when you're in Un form. Weaver Song plus Sprint Master makes your Weaverlings move 1.5 times as fast. Dash Master and Sprint Master ups your base movement speed even further. Combining the two Grub Charms, Grub Song and Grubberfly's Elegy, almost doubles the amount of soul you get when taking damage, which is incredibly helpful. And Defender's Crest plus Fluke Nest is perhaps the best of the bunch, replacing the Fluke Swarm you shoot with one massive exploding Giga Fluke. As the game continues and the difficulty mounts, the combat becomes an ever more challenging, ever more fun puzzle, providing intense tests of skill that can often be frustrating, but never feel truly unfair. Here the game is very much following in the footsteps of the Apocal Dark Souls, which really pioneered the tough but fair combat loop in the modern era, and which, to me and many others, leads to what is pretty much peak gaming satisfaction once its difficult baddies are finally vanquished. With its late game and secret bosses, and eventually its DLC, Hollow Knight absolutely leans into its identity as a combat platformer, with Team Cherry seeming to delight in building ever tougher battles, topping anything that appears in the vanilla game with the incredible hair-pulling showdowns against Nightmare King Grimm, the Pure Vessel, and the game's ultimate challenge. Absolute Radiance. And though it borrows from Dark Souls in some ways, I also like that it zags in other ways, establishing its own identity. Unlike Dark Souls, the instant responsiveness eliminates the sense of unfairness you get from feeling like you aren't in control of your moves. One of the most frustrating parts of the Dark Souls experience can be when you accidentally input something or you're being too hasty and input a move that leaves you stuck in an animation and stuck in an exposed position. Here, you don't have that. You are constantly in control, but it still creates the same sense of player responsibility. If you are always capable of making a change, of getting yourself out of trouble, then you getting hit is always your fault. Here, you aren't bound by the limited nature of your options, but by having so many options and being forced to make snap decisions about which are the right ones. Game feel. So the combat and platforming are how the game is played, but what does it feel like when it all comes together? In a word, fantastic. Hollow Knight's gameplay is smooth as butter, incredibly well-designed, fluid, responsive, immersive, and engaging. One thing that the game does so well is imbue us with this feeling of mastery, of us as the player growing alongside the knight. While he builds up his arsenal with additional jumps, dashes, and attacks, we build up our ability to use this arsenal in a tactile way that is just deeply satisfying. Progression is a standard concept in games, mandatory in most, but few do it as well as Hollow Knight. To me, this is in part because all the additions to the Knight's arsenal raise the skill ceiling instead of heightening the skill floor. Basically, the Hollow Knight's new abilities don't truly make the game easier. What they do is give us, as the player, the chance to improve our ability to play the game. To me, it honestly reminds me a lot of the experience of learning a new instrument. I'm a lifelong guitarist, so I naturally think of musicianship first in those terms. First, you have to learn the basics, the tuning of the strings, coordination, and so on. Then you begin to string those things together. You play smoke on the water and such. In Hollow Knight, this is like the first boss, the False Knight, where you have to string together the modular battle movements you've put together as you fought the weak, unthinking enemies along the way, and put them into practice consistently in order to execute on what you want to do to avoid failure. Then, as the game goes on and you get new skills like the Monarch Wings and the Shade Cloak, it's like learning about more advanced techniques like sweep picking or tapping. Each improvement, each skill, offers a new chance for one's mastery to be improved. And when it all does come together, time and time again, it feels like nailing a new song, your hardest one yet. There is a music and a rhythm to the pace of battle and platforming in the game's difficult moments. And nailing those moments showcasing your mastery offers not just the mental satisfaction, but the physical, tactile delights of that mind-body connection the dopamine-shooting sense of flow that is one of the peak experiences that we can have as human people. It equips Team Cherry very well that, in a game where they went in knowing the first thing they had to tune was the knight and his movements, the end result was so beautifully buttery smooth. It's also part of the genius of the Godmaster DLC, their delightful lore-based punch-up of a boss rush mode, as the battles and pantheons serve as a crucible that really burns the Hollow Knight experience down to its best and most intense moments, letting the flow fly in its best and most concentrated form. Domo, 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 Domo! <laughs>
The entire aesthetic of this game is just gorgeous. It is darkly beautiful, is diversely executed, but remarkably consistent. Every area of the map is immediately recognizable for its color palette and environmental touches, while still looking nothing less than 100%, or should I say 112%, Hollow Knight. Having that sort of breadth of expression while still remaining artistically coherent is in itself an incredible feat. You can truly pick out which part of the map you're in based on color palette alone, which really speaks to the sort of cohesive universe that Team Cherry has built in Hollow Knight. It's a testament to what hand-drawn visuals can do. The hand-drawn visuals add this sort of vectored smoothness that makes everything on screen feel so seamlessly beautiful and, frankly, much more high dollar than a small indie game could if it was using more standard animation tools, more cost-effective, time-effective animation tools. And that smoothness transfers to the animation. This is a game of dark shadows, bright palettes, and simple animations, something that Team Cherry has expressed in various forward that they did because it allowed them to save times on the small stuff in order to create an even grander game. We've talked a lot about the instant responsiveness, and it really does start at the beginning. The nail your attack comes out in two frames, and the game is populated with all sorts of little stuff that really adds to the experience. One thing that I didn't even notice until my research for this video, which I found in this incredible video by Video Game Animation Study, is the arc of dust that follows your character when you jump. I'll let them explain it here. You might be quick to assume that there's two dust animations for when you jump. One for straight up, and one for when you jump when running. But upon closer inspection, you'll see that the dust follows your exact path. And this is because the dust trail is a generated effect in Unity. This game also makes great use of the parallax, the things in frame being both in front of and behind you, which is a small thing, but I always find it to be such an incredible touch. It makes the world feel so alive, so genuine. Your exploration of this place not fictional, but actual and immersive. I would not be mad if all games basically did something like this. I mentioned Metroid Dread earlier, one of my favorite moments of that game is when the Silver Chozo Soldier first appears in front of your screen before jumping onto your field of play, into your play in a battle. One of the few moments in the game where it actually plays with this kind of foreground layering, and it's just mwah, it's a standout memory for me. And in general, the 3D layered planes rendered in the game engine create just this incredible feeling of depth and expansiveness, like there's an even larger world awaiting us just through the looking glass. And the character designs are magnificent too. I touched a little on some of them when I went over the characters in the story section, but these designs are great. They range from charmingly simple to surprisingly complex, and the character designs are just magnificent. And it all starts with our silent hero. What is perhaps counterintuitive is that the knight is maybe the simplest character in the whole game. He's barely more than a line drawing with a few simple parts, but there's such character to him and his movements. I love how his only facial feature, beyond I guess horns, are these cute oversized eyes. And I actually think there's a lot of cool stuff going on behind the scenes. Why is that? I'm glad you asked. As humans, our associations of cuteness are heavily tied to the idea of helplessness. So much so that brains release chemicals like oxytocin when we're taken by something we find cute. A bonding hormone that inherently makes us feel more protective of the cute object, usually a small thing like, you know, a baby. That's why it's actually considered part of evolutionary adaptation. It's not just that we happen to love babies and that babies are also cute, it's that part of why we're so compulsively loving and protective towards these small creatures is that there has been a naturally selected trend towards this cuteness in order for us to feel protective of them. Also, as much as I love evolutionary explanations of phenomena like this, as they support some really interesting and surprising conclusions, it's also worth noting that they're largely impossible to disprove, meaning that many don't hold up from a purely scientific standpoint. Having said this, I did look this up, and this is one that we got good science on. The elegance of this cuteness is that it gives us a rooting interest in an otherwise silent, largely unemotive character who could otherwise be deeply disinteresting. A vessel, get it, for our gameplay, but someone who we as players attach to, a character recognizable and iconic. And beyond the craftiness of using this cuteness as a rooting interest, something to hook us into the character, it also creates a really fun contrast as the knight becomes more and more of a skilled, nail-wielding, buggy superhero. What I mean is that inherent to the whole needs protection element of cuteness is the inbuilt low status nature of a cute character. Status is an underdiscussed but deeply important part of writing characters. I think it comes up most often in the improv comedy world where it's also extremely valuable, as it's something that permeates every interaction we have as people, and it affects how we act and our perceptions of our actions. In essence, a clean-shaven dude in a suit being late to a meeting is read very different than a stubbly, underdressed dude. The first reads more like a VIP running behind due to all the VIB, very important business, he has to attend to, while the second feels more like someone who will soon get a short letter from HR about company culture and future endeavors. Tying that all back into the topic at hand, a cute character is inherently low status. The low status is part of why we feel so protective like that of a baby. 
And if that baby suddenly becomes a sword-wheeling, dash-dancing, spirit-bombing badass, as with Hollow Knight, it fully defies our expectations, creating a delightful subversion of expectations while also being deeply fun to watch. See also, Boss Baby. Beyond the Knight, most main characters have similarly simple designs, which are all done very well, but which also make the more complexly designed characters really stand out. The Hollow Knight being one of them, clearly a more advanced, more intimidating, higher status version of our character. Our rounded edges become sharp angles, our simple needle a complex blade, our tiny stature a titanic build. It really shows the spectrum of knights and vessels, and gives you an idea of why this is the guy that was chosen for the big task. And this sick design of the pure vessel's white palace armor just elevates this if and when you do cross its path in God Home. The Radiance is a really fun and fitting final boss so well designed, the most other feeling of the game's many boss creatures, and a fantastic synthesis of this idea of ethereal godliness along with worldly mothiness. And man, I will just never get over the sort of pseudo joke that the big bad villain is a moth who represents light. Like they basically turned the idea of a moth to a flame into a masterpiece and dang it, I am here for it. Grim was another incredible DLC addition to the game, being this creepy, intimidating, slender phantom of the buggy opera, who stands well enough on his own, only for the Nightmare King version of him to blow the original out of the water. I mean, he's red. That's cooler. Seriously, the Nightmare King Grim entrance is one of the most badass in the game, and the first of only two full-screen boss title cards, alongside the game's true ultimate boss, Absolute Radiance. Some other bosses that stand out, the Dream Warriors, I think they have incredibly cool designs, my favorite being Markov. I mean, just look at it. The way they managed to make this red bug somehow look complex, regal, knightly, it's awesome. Though he is very much akin to the many other bugs of Hollow Nest in certain ways, he also feels somehow distinct, as if he's from a distant realm with battles, stories, and struggles all its own. I also really love the designs of the Nail Masters Oro, Mato, and Shio. The internet is split on what bug they're actually based on, with the consensus trending either towards Elephant Beetle or Japanese Rhinoceros Beetle, neither of which I had any idea about before looking it up, but no matter what they're based on, they're rendered beautifully in the game, and it's one of the game's many delights that you get to fight them in the Godmaster DLC, where they each get to live up to the promise of their premise and show off their signature blade arts in fun, evolved ways. In fact, Nailmaster Shio may be my favorite character in the game. I love his lore, a spin on the classic trope of the master who has hung up his blade, in this case turning to the arts, to painting, to occupy his mind and hand in search of a more peaceful form of mastery and it's only made cooler by how Team Cherry renders him in his Godmaster fight, turning his paintbrush into his latest instrument of death, with these colored globules of paint that go fly, color-coded to each of Shio's many different strikes. I just love the flavor of it all, hopefully it's not lead-based, and it's heightened by him being one of the Pantheon's final bosses, viewing this new fight with a known character with an even greater level of gravitas. And lastly, a few other NPCs worthy of honorable mentions. There's the Pale King I mentioned before, he's a similar iteration of the knight, which is clearly more evolved, more angular, more regal, and otherly enough to give him this dimensionality. This feels like someone who has come from a different place, and it fits. The White Lady, I touched on her earlier, it's just a really standout design, one of the most unique in the game, and really stunning when you first come upon it. And maybe my favorite weird one is the Mask Maker, another character who I didn't find until a later playthrough. This enigmatic skittery being locked in the far corners of Deep Nest is one of my favorites in the game something I didn't discover until those later playthroughs and whose appearance just lent further credence to the idea of Hollow Knight as a game with a living, breathing world where there's always more to uncover. Domo, 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 Domo! <laughs> Some of my favorite game design touches in Hollow Knight are these subversive moves that make the world feel alive. Much like how Scream is a horror movie that knows the conventions of horror movies, meaning that it knows how to play with your expectations of those conventions and thus make it impossible to guess what is to come, so it is with Hollow Knight. This is a game that so clearly understands Metroidvanias and the other game conventions that it's embracing that you never know when those ideas will be embraced or subverted, constantly keeping you on your toes, building a world that feels alive, unique, and different as you go. Like, you can bust out of the False Knight's battle chamber if you hit this weak wall that I've, I've never seen a game do that, let alone a Metroidvania. I didn't know about this until I was watching YouTube videos for the game, and it's such a cool, interesting, and unique move. It lets you know that your expectations are kind of out the window, and that anything really could happen at any point of this game. Another great move that it does is nest its secret areas, meaning put things like a breakable wall behind a breakable wall behind another breakable wall to find some of the game's deepest secrets. There's the Grey Mourner as one example, 
Getting to the Grim Warner is like an exercise in fuckery, as you have to destroy like three separate, not at all obvious cracks in walls and ceilings in order to get there. I did not know about this MF until I went well into my second playthrough and was looking things up for this video. Similarly, Zote's Godseeker Homage The Eternal Ordeal is one of those impossible to discover on your own secrets that I only found out while doing research for this video too. If you do everything that Hollow Knight tells you to do, you're gonna have a bad time. The game's default ending is, quite honestly, horrific, with you as the knight becoming the new vessel to contain the Radiance's infection, not even truly fixing this land's blight, just perpetuating its cycle, staving off the end days for a time, but not forever. It's dark. It's depressing. It's like a slap in the face, but a kinky, consensual one. The game is saying to you, oh, you only did the bare minimum? Well, here's what you get. Here's what you deserve. It's throwing down the gauntlet for you to explore further, and cover the many greater secrets the world has to offer. Because, after all this time, you simply can't leave this world in tragedy, can you? Doma, 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 doma! <laughs> I truly don't know where to begin when talking about this incredible soundtrack. I think I actually heard about the soundtrack for Hollow Knight before I ever even played the game initially. For one thing, it has an entire life to itself in the YouTube sphere. There are a bunch of great quality reaction channels who I've seen go through the entire soundtrack and be blown away by the amazing work that Christopher Larkin was able to put together for this game. The instrumentation, the arrangements, the quality of production, it all far outstrips anything that an indie game ever really should be able to do. But it does it here, and it does it amazingly. The tracks from beginning to end are incredible, transcendent, orchestral. They sound like works that could be ripped from Mozart or Beethoven or one of the classical masters. It starts at the beginning with this dark, melancholy vibe that suffuses the entire thing. And then it begins to change. First you have Green Path, which starts to get a little more brighter, a little more positive. You have Hornet's incredible theme. And then as time goes on, you get things like the Dung Defender's rousing theme. You have the Harpsy Chords in the Mantis Lord boss fight, which is incredible, that's elevated even further in the Sisters of Battle version that came out in the DLC. The Crystal Peak soundtrack is amazing. It has this insane reverb and mixing to it. It really feels like you can hear the sounds echoing off the cavernous walls and bouncing through these pink crystals. And of course, my favorite touch of all, in the Grim Troop DLC, when you finally fight Nightmare King Grim, you get that double pedal heavy metal in a soundtrack that otherwise sticks pretty purely in the string sample, which are classically instrumented samples. Here, shit goes hard, and it becomes a metal song, as it should. You're fighting the fucking devil for God's sake, or should I say, for Grim's sake. And also one thing that I like to point out in these videos is that the most effective use of something is not always its use. This was true in Scream when they knew to pull back on the horror. This is true in comedy when you know when to not land a joke. Some of the greatest moments in Hollow Knight, some of the greatest musical choices come in the abyss. This bottom of the world place where all is darkness, all is sadness, all is melancholy, all is lost. And here, instead of soundtrack, there's just silence. Doma, 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 doma! <laughs> For me, Hollow Knight is one of those forever games, a piece that you can come back to time and time again and still reap almost as much delight as the first play. This is something that is true of a lot of Metroidvanias, and it works for a few reasons. Though being a game that's all about explorations and secrets, it's more or less impossible to remember every twist and turn that Hollow Knight contains, meaning that future playthroughs aren't ruined at all, they're simply smoother experiences. It's one of gaming's great pleasures to crush a boss that used to give you trouble, especially on your first try, and that's a common thread of a Hollow Knight playthrough, letting you progress faster and feel more like a badass along the way. Looking at you, Soul Master, you bastard. And the beauty of a game with a difficulty like Hollow Knight's is that it never is truly easy. Combat is never trivial, and neither are any of the true platforming challenges. What you gain on future playthroughs is instead the ability to drop into that flow state so much faster. Your performance still needs to be there, the execution still needs to be there. But now, the experienced player can pull out all the requisite skills with greater fluency and thus greater delight. Because of that, even the game's breezier moments are so much fun, and the later challenges, the DLC bosses like Nightmare King Grim and the ultimate test of the Path of Pain, will forever be satisfying when they're able to be bested. The sense of the unknown is replaced with a sense of mastery, a different charm, but one that meshes with the entire experience all the same. And, with its many secret sub-areas and optional challenges, each playthrough of the game is its own unique experience. As such, the diminishing marginal returns of the Hollow Knight experience are almost nil. 
There are so many ways to complete this sprawling game, but no two paths will ever truly be the same, even on a quest for the ultimate completion of 112%. Put all of that together, and you've got a perennial game, fit to be dusted off just about whenever the urge arises, and one that will always find new ways to reward you for doing so. That's replayability. Domo, 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 domo! <laughs> As one of the most recent pieces of art that I've yet to take on on this channel, Hollow Knight's legacy is much less cemented than some of the other legendary works I've discussed. Its true impact on the gaming world is still being writ, but the consequences of its appearance can already be seen. First of all, it can be thanked for kickstarting or elevating the careers of more than a few excellent YouTubers, who do everything from break down the game's singular lore to subject themselves to ever more brutal challenge and speedruns. But what the game has done is provide yet another example of what is capable in the indie model of what a team of even as small as two can do to turn their passions into a product beloved by the masses, one that is free from the creativity by committee, kitchen sink design choices of its AAA brethren, and instead one that can be guided more in the vein of Michelangelo chipping away at marble, finding the game by getting rid of all the things that the game isn't, until what is finally discovered is its true and ultimate form, pure, specific, and unique, but with slightly less dong. Team Cherry is also in the process of cementing their own legacy, with the mimetically long digesting sequel Silk Song, a game so long in the making that its existence is practically spoken about in a hushed whisper for fear that citing it directly will lead to another six months of delay. Though demo footage has been released, whetting the appetites of cherry heads everywhere, no real idea of the game's roadmap and delivery timeline exists, leading fans to speculate with an ever more conspiratorial bet. Only time will truly tell. But for now, as far as legacy is concerned, we can content ourselves with the knowledge that Hollow Knight is in the rare pantheon of games that can, and did, cement itself as an instant classic. So at the end of a long road, here, at the center of the metaphorical temple of the Black Egg, what was it all for? What did we learn? What is it, in the end, that elevates Hollow Knight from a mere game to a transcendent experience that prompts someone like me to make an hour-long video essay about it? Why do we like Hollow Knight? Perhaps it's being immersed in a world of story, transforming ourselves just for a time into needled dancers in the grand, tragic, melancholic ballet of Hollow Nest. Perhaps it's the beauty that we discover in the struggle, picking up our controllers again and again, despite facing ever greater challenges of ability and agility, challenges designed not just to test the mettle of our knightly avatar, but of us, the player, constantly being asked the question of, is it worth it? Can you do it? Will you? Perhaps it's the incredible release we feel when the mounting tensions of defeat are finally dispelled by our skill, our fortitude, and our will alone to triumph. And man, that shit feels good. Perhaps it even transcends the experience of the game itself, the knowledge of the testament to the power of indie gaming that this entire piece of art is, seeing two primary creators sculpt a world so rich, so engaging, so darkly delightful that it rivals and even surpasses that of conglomerates far more corporate and cold. It's place a shining exemplar that great art doesn't need an army to be born. Sometimes it just needs a vision, and two people willing to pursue that vision. But perhaps most likely, it's all of that and more, the feelings and memories and sorrows and joys that we take from such a truly immersive journey through this strange new world. Memories that perhaps could be rivaled by other great works, but could never, ever be replaced. And isn't that the mark of a true masterpiece? So thank you for joining me on this journey through Hollow Knight. As always on Why Do We Like, we delve deep to uncover the essence of what makes games like this resonate with us so profoundly. And in the case of Hollow Knight, it's clear. This is a game that not only challenges our skills, but captivates our hearts and imaginations, leaving an indelible mark not on us, but on the canvas of gaming history. And a controller dent on our walls as we try to be Pantheon 5 pure vessel. What the fuck is your problem, bro?